Hello, I'm Luga Torix, and welcome to my Western Roman Empire faction guide for Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion. And this is an extra special one because, well, this campaign has a bit of a reputation. It is, you could say, notorious for not only being one of the hardest campaigns on Rome Total War, but being one of the hardest campaigns on any Total War game ever. I mean, this really is a challenge. And, well, there's many reasons why this campaign is a challenge, and we will be going over them in this video. The, the game says that it has a difficulty factor of estimated hard. Trust me, that is no estimation. That is an absolute guarantee that unless you are some sort of magical pro player, this is a hard campaign. Now, you might think, well, that's weird because, well, we own quite a lot of territory. I mean, you can see there's big red regions of the map that we own. We own bits of what is now Great Britain. We own bits of what's now modern-day France, Italy slice of North Africa, bits of Spain. Yeah, we own plenty of territory, but trust me, that is a bit of a blessing, but it's also very much a curse as well, which again, we'll get to discussing in a minute. So, to complete the campaign, you have to hold 34 settlements, including Northern Italy, which is the sort of uh, light red region that has a sword thrust in the middle of it. Africa, which is the region over here, if we circle that. Tarko, Tarkonensis, okay, I can't speak, and Thracia. Uh, so yeah, a few territories you have to take along the way, but you need to get to 34 as well. So, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of discuss some strategy, how to get out the economic, political and religious mess that you're in at the beginning of the game, and also talk about some of the units as well. So, let's get straight into the video, no more chatting, we need to get repairing this empire. Now, what I'd normally do at this point is show you the unit roster, here it is, and I'd go through each unit one by one, discussing the sort of positive and negatives of each unit. But, I've basically already done this with the Eastern Roman Empire faction guide. The Eastern Roman Empire has basically an identical uh, roster, it's not in you know, 100% identical, we will go over that in a second, um, but they are very, very similar. So for example, you know, going over Cometa Tenses, Limitane, I've already discussed these units, these exact units before uh, in my Eastern Roman Empire faction guides. If you want to hear me discuss about Limitane, Cometa Tenses, uh, Federati, Infantry, whatever, um, go into the description and there will be a link to the Eastern Roman Empire faction guide where I talk about them in more detail. Now, there isn't a huge amount of difference between the two armies, these two factions. Um, there are a few slight differences. First of all, this unit here is a Catholic priest. For the Eastern Roman Empire, I believe it is an Orthodox priest. Now, I think they're basically the same. They serve the same purpose, which is not to fight, but to sort of inspire nearby troops, help keep the morale up so they'll fight for a bit longer. But again, they're basically the same as the Orthodox priest, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, um, one of the main differences is that, first of all, the Western Roman Empire only have basic archers. They do not have access to the, um, I think they're called Eastern archers, uh, and they are basically a better version of these guys. You either have the archers, or you have the Buccellari, I think that's how you pronounce it. My Latin isn't very good, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, you basically only have access to the very, very basic archers, uh, so the Eastern Roman Empire have a little bit more luxury in their missile troops. Also, the difference between the Western Roman Empire cavalry and the Eastern Roman Empire cavalry is probably the biggest one. Um, both factions get you know, access to stuff like um, Scole Palatini, um, but for example, the Eastern Roman Empire get access to horse archers, I think they're called Hippotoxotai, and they also get access to units that are, I think they're called cataphracts, or you know, cataphractoi or something like that. Um, so we have, yeah, here we go, equites, cataphracti. Pretty badass stuff. You can see just by looking at the cavalry, it's much better armoured. So you're kind of at a disadvantage because you don't have the horse archers, you don't have the heavily, heavily armoured uh, cavalry as well. You have these sort of more basic cavalry, which I have already discussed in my Eastern Roman Empire. But some of it is still pretty good though. I mean, you know, the, the Imperial German bodyguard, uh, pretty solid indeed. I believe that the siege equipment is identical as well, and both factions get access to carriage blisters. So yeah, no point in me going over stuff that I've already discussed before. If you want to see me talk about these geezers, then go over to the Eastern Roman Faction Guide. But remember, you won't get access to all the troops. There will be a few that aren't available in this faction because it just is that little bit harder. But I want to get really straight into the actual campaign, talking about the difficulties of the Western Roman Empire and how to solve them as best as you can. So let's do that right now. So here we are, the campaign for the Western Roman Empire. Now, first of all, I, al well, I always say this, but I'm going to say it again. 
Uh, I, I do these faction guides with the Fog of War off just to show you what's around, but I don't ever play with the Fog of War off. I consider it to be cheating, but just for the sort of demonstration purposes, it is off. I don't want you to think I'm a cheat. So we start off with a message, a storm from the east. This is the same for all the factions. Um, the Huns and the uh, Vandals are, they are, you know, horde factions that are up sort of in the sort of north of uh, Europe, and they might be causing you a bit of trouble. But trust me, there are bigger concerns closer to home at the beginning of the campaign as well. So yet yeah, two groups of people in flight and a powerful faith, paganism, which is a bit of a problem, one of many problems you'll face. So here is the empire. And you see, we own a big region. We own a big, big red region of the western part of the map. We own like, you know, nearly half of the map. Things look good, but then you scroll down, you have a look, and you see that we have a thousand denarii, which is a very, very small amount considering the amount of territories you own. Normally in a sort of Rome Total War campaign, if you had an empire this size, you'd be in the tens of thousands of denarii, possibly even the hundreds of thousands. You wouldn't be at a mere 1,000. If you then have a look at the finances in greater detail, let's go on to the financial section, you will see that the projected profits are minus 1,232 on the first turn. This is um, very hard difficulty. I don't know if it actually varies depending on the difficulty. This is the worst case scenario, but it's still very, very bad indeed. So yeah, you start off with 1,000, but next turn we will be in debt. And uh, yeah, you don't want to be in debt because obviously then you can't recruit, you can't build, etc, etc. So you need to reverse that very, very quickly. What you'll also notice is that we start off with terrible public order we have access or you know a view of three settlements already they're all red let's have a look at spain they're all red oh that's more red more red more red a little bit of yellow up there but basically there's a lot of unhappy people in the empire and there's many reasons why they're unhappy we'll get to that in a second but of course you don't want settlements to be unhappy because well they revolt and not only will they revolt but if uh, you know western roman empire cities revolt then you give birth to a new faction which is the we the rest the western roman rebels that is really quite a mouthful by the way the rest the western roman rebels um and they can be quite strong if you sort of leave them to uh, grow on their own so don't want to really be spawning too many rebels you want to sort out this public order and again if you start losing settlements you start losing population you're losing taxpayers which is going to be one of your main sources of income in the early game because there isn't a huge amount of ports or anything like that so now there is I will start off by saying there is a strategy which I am going to acknowledge but not necessarily endorse unless you're really really desperate because I, I feel like it's kind of against the sort of ethos of the campaign. I have seen many people on the internet who have said that what you can do is deliberately lose certain settlements at the beginning. For example, you can lose parts of Britain. Some people just abandon Britain. They say a Burakum and Londinium, see you later, we'll move the troops or just get rid of them and just completely destroy those settlements uh, and bring them to the rebels. You know, you can remove settlements in Spain from your control and say, okay, they can just go over to rebels. And what those people do is they get rid of half the empire, consolidate the empire in the important bits, which is basically northern Italy, and then sort of grow the faction from the most secure point, which is around, which is around Rome. Now, you can do that. The only thing I think is the sort of problem with that is you might as well just play as the Eastern Roman Empire or the Sassanids or something like that if you're going to have that attitude. Um, because the whole sort of fun of this campaign is trying to maintain this large empire. If you deliberately decide to collapse it and then regrow it, you, you might as well just be playing as any old faction. It kind of ruins the fun for me personally of playing as a large faction. So I will be trying to discuss how to maintain the empire as much as possible. Now, there is a sort of warning. You will not be able to keep every single settlement. I, I can't imagine you can. I think even the top, top, totes war players might lose one or two settlements along the way. That does happen. What you need to make sure, though, is that they're not important settlements and you need to make sure that the rebels can't you know, sort of get too strong off the back of it, which we'll discuss in a second. So first of all, there's a lot to discuss here. Why is the public order so bad? Well, one of the main re the reasons is religion. Now, the faction leader, which is Valentinius the Wrathful, is in Rome, where he should be in Rome anyway, unless he's uh, gone on holiday. There he is, Valentinius the Wrathful. Now, he is Christian, which is fine, and Rome itself is Christian, so the faction is Christian. But the majority of the settlements are pagan. You can see by this symbol here, the sort of weird Y-Yen kind of symbol, um, that they're pagan. 
So you have Rome that's Christian, but the vast majority of settlements are pagan. There's a lot of pagan uh, generals and stuff like that. And what it means is there's kind of a divide between the sort of central big figures, the big the big guns in Rome, and the rest of the empire, which is causing major public order issues. That's one of the main reasons. Also, you know, taxes are a little bit too high at the beginning. And also, Rome is the capital, and it isn't in a very good position. Um, because obviously in a normal campaign, let's say if you were... Rome, real life Rome, a couple of hundred years before this, Rome itself was a very central place to the empire. If you look at the entire Roman Empire, it's very, very central. But in this instance, actually, it's quite a little bit over to the east, meaning that factions in Spain, for example, have a massive debuff because they're far away from the capital. The closer the city is to the capital, the more public order it's going to have. So what I would do is, the first thing I would do is try and centralise the capital. And I would probably move it to Massilia because it's nice in the middle, it's on the coast, it's a pretty decent place. So I'm going to immediately make Massilia the capital and hopefully public order in this region should get a little bit better. A little bit. You see Arles, I don't know how you say that. That's a little bit better. Augusta Vindelicorum is a little bit better, but there's still a lot of red. Now what you need to do is for the settlements that aren't green, yellow or anything else or blue, you need to lower the taxes as much as you can. Now this might you know, seem a little bit odd because you have a thousand denarii, you want to be making as much money as possible, but if the settlements rebel, you're not going to get any money from them. You might as well get a little bit of money and keep the settlement if you can. So I'm not going to do it for all the settlements, but for example, Mediolanium is on a normal tax rate. If you do it to a low tax rate, it's still red. That was a terrible example. <laughs> that was a terrible example. All right, better example. You won't be able to keep all the settlements, by the way. Uh, Taraco. Lower the tax rate, now you're not going to lose it. You can't lose settlement if it's blue, unless it gets, you know, taken by another army. Uh, but Bordeaux, I think this is Bordeaux, lower it, now they're happy again. And you can go around the empire. What I would do is have the maximum tax rate without it being red. For a lot of the settlements it will be low, but some of them you can maybe bump up to sort of middle range tax rates. And then immediately what you'll see is you'll see a little bit of happiness a little bit of stability anyway. You're not going to click end turn and half the empire is going to disappear because you've got a more central capital and you've got lower tax rates, meaning the people are going to be slightly happier. But again, some settlements you're just not going to be able to keep. For example, Avaricum, I think, is one that a lot of people seem to lose um, because it's just a really tough one to keep. I think, is there not a... No, you see, there's no governor in there. The garrison's okay, but the garrison's pretty decent, but it's pagan, it's the, the wrong religion, it's way too big for the facilities that it's got. I mean, if you look at the city, you see it's got nice big walls, a big population, but, you know, not the best facilities, only a small trader and stuff like that. So, it's, there's going to be a lot of squalor and all that, which is a big issue. Now, there is a tactic, um, and I don't particularly like doing this, but sometimes it has to be done. Let's say there is a settlement that is sort of beyond any kind of... Um, saving, yeah, it's it's gonna go. Let's say a varicum. You identify a varicum. You know it's gonna go. There's nothing you can do about it. How the rebels work is that the better facilities you have, the better barracks you have, determines what the rebel army is going to consist of. So, for example, if you have militia barracks, like you have over here, you can have Limitani Federati infantry that you can, you know, call upon. If this city goes rebel, the garrison that comes in the city will also be consistent, consisting of Federati and Limitane, for example. Now what you want is you want those settlements when they rebel to consist of peasants, because that means that when you're ready to retake it, you can just march in, peasants, chop them down, see you later, we've got our city back. So what you want to do is, let's say Avaricum, we don't have any chance of keeping that, get rid of the barracks, and then the rebels that come in here won't be able to recruit decent units, meaning they won't be able to defend themselves against you when you go to retake it. And bear in mind, when you do retake it, you can sack the settlement, get a ton of money out of it. But also you can get more money because 400 denarii by getting rid of the militia barracks, now you have a bit more money. So it kind of works to two ends in that respect. Now let's talk about finances a little bit more. Now, for example, I'm going to go over here to Spain. And you'll see some of these regions like Salamantica. Now, there's no one near Salamantica, yet the Berbers are quite a bit south. But really, it's unlikely anyone's going to go for that. So, for example, try and get rid of as many buildings that you don't need. Salamantica really doesn't need militia barracks. I would get rid of them as well. You've got another 400 denarii. What you're going to start doing is building up your finances so that you can afford to spend it on more important stuff 
which we'll discuss in a minute. So something I would go is would do is go around getting rid of not only the buildings necessarily, but sometimes maybe the armies as well. For example, Salamanca. Let's have a look. That's not got, that's not got a very good force. But let's say it had a big force in it. Cut down on some of the armies, maybe. If you identify there's an army in the middle of nowhere that isn't going to be attacked anytime soon, just get rid of it. If it's not needed, don't pay their wages because you're going to be in a lot of debt, okay? Just get rid of them, you know, disperse them into the population, let them become taxpayers. Now, something I want to discuss is religion because religion is very, very important in this, uh, in this campaign. Uh, this is, you know, a huge factor, and it's a huge reason why your public order is bad. And there's kind of two methods of going about religion. You have two choices of what religion you want to choose. You can choose to either paganize the empire, or you can choose to Christianize the empire. Now, paganizing the empire, making it pagan, is seen as the more short-term perspective, the more short-term solution to solving your problems. Christianizing the empire is the more long-term solution, and I'll explain why by having a look at the actual buildings. So here are the buildings you can make, and let's just quickly scroll down here, and we'll be able to see the temples. Now, let's have a look, for example, at the awesome temple of Mithras, which is a pagan uh, temple. Now, you can see some pretty cool stuff here. We've got the paganism, but not a huge amount of public order bonus, but you have got the experience bonus the troops tra uh, trained here, plus two, which is important because it's going to be much better in battles. Now, Christian churches go up to a much higher level, or one higher level, a Christian bas basilica. You don't have the fighting benefits necessarily, but you do have a lot more happiness benefits from the Christian basilica. Um, as you can see, 15, 10, and 25% all of this happiness is going to make your settlements a lot more stable in the long run. Second of all, I believe that Christian settlements have access to, yes, a hermitage. Or it goes up to an abbey, which is even more a happiness. And you get a little bit of training for the Catholic priest. is isn't really that important, to be honest. But the public order bonus. So there are basically two, two ways of going around it. You've got the pagan solution, which means that you can take advantage of the fact that the majority of the empire is pagan already. And just paganize everything, which is fine. Um, but then in the long term, you're not going to have really, really good public order because you, your temples aren't, you know, sort of um, beneficial to public order as much as the Christian ones are. Also, the faction leader is Christian and the majority of your family members are actually going to be Christian. So there's a very high chance that for a long, long time into the future, you're going to have a faction leader or family members, high ranking people of the faction that are Christian, but the people are pagan, and that's going to cause a sort of, uh, you know, disruption in the empire. It's going to cause public order issues, which isn't good. If, on the other hand, you decide to Christianize the empire, then you're going to have the people are going to be the same religion as the faction leader, which is good. That's going to immediately raise public order, uh, you know, big time. And also, you're going to have access to these high-ranking hermitage and abbeys and flipping, um, you know, basilicas and all that that are going to have really good high public order bonuses, meaning you can then eventually bump up the tax rates, start getting more money, and really start solidifying the empire to a point where you're ready to start conquering people. So I would go for the Christian option, not the pagan option per, uh, personally, but you can go either way. I just think the pagan option is a little bit short-sighted, uh, in my opinion. Now, you could argue, well, why don't you just go pagan at the beginning, really go for the whole pagan thing, and then switch over to Christianity? That is... I would not recommend. You need to make your decision nice and early because it is very difficult once you properly paganize a faction to then, you know, sort of flip the switch and then go Christian. When you're doing that sort of flipping the switch bit, you're going to have a huge amount of public order issues and you're going to be back to square one where half the, the faction is Christian, half the faction is pagan. What you want to do is just go completely one way or completely the other way. If you switch up, you're just going to have a complete mess like you have here. So in my opinion, the easiest time to start Christianizing the people is now. Do it now at the beginning. And also, it has a double effect because, for example, let's say settlements have, uh, are pagan and they have a pagan religious building. You can get rid of that pagan religious building, that temple or whatever they have, shrine or whatever, and you get money out of it. So not only are you helping the public order by making the settlements all the same religion, but you're also getting money from destroying more buildings, which is pretty cool as well. So I would definitely recommend the Christian option, but you can do it either way. I think most sort of you know good Total War players would recommend the Christian option, though. That is the sort of more long-term solution. 
So how do you start building up the economy? Well, first of all, you really need to cut down on your expenditure. Let's have a quick look at the finances, actually, because we're spending far too much. So you see army upkeep, 30, basically 36,000. Wages, 4,800. Corruption. This stuff isn't good, but the main expenditure is the army upkeep. You basically have too much army for what you're going to be doing early on. In this campaign, it's all about the... It's sort of, I suppose, kind of three stages, but really the first stage of the campaign before you start expanding anywhere is to try and consolidate your empire. You cannot go marching into Eastern Roman territory. You cannot go marching against the barbarian factions or the Celts or the Berbers or whatever until you've got a solid, you know, sort of backbone, a solid homeland in which to call upon for money and for troops. Trust me, you cannot, you cannot just start marching everywhere. It, you know, it's crazy. So what you want to do, your main thing you want to do, is actually cut down on troops at the, at the beginning so that you can raise money and then be in a situation where, okay, now I'm financially stable, now I'm ready to actually, and you know, the public order is stable as well, now I've got a nice bit of stability, we can start then pushing armies towards wherever you want to go. Now another way you can make money is through uh, diplomacy. And the, uh, for some reason, map information in this campaign is really, really highly sort of sought after, I would say. Uh, really highly sought after. So what you can do is you can get diplomats and you can go to the Alemanni or the Franks or the Saxons or whatever and say, look, give us, a, I don't know, let's say a thousand denarii. Sometimes they will pay up to a thousand denarii for this stuff. Give us a thousand denarii and we'll give you all this map information because we own a huge amount of territory. We know what's going on in the world. And they will do that. And even if you're at war with them sometimes. So, you know, go around to two or three factions and then you've got, you know, three or four K going up and you can start reinvesting the money. And reinvesting the money into where? Well, important things are ports, really. I wouldn't say farms are particularly important in this campaign, personally. People might disagree with me on that. But in most total war campaigns, I'll say go for farms because you want to raise the population as much as possible. The problem with this campaign is most of the cities have too much population. You have a really, really high population with no facilities, meaning you're going to get a huge amount of squalor. So you don't really want population to be going up. Plus, you've got low tax rates because, like I discussed earlier, you need to lower tax in order to have public order you know, being okay. You've got low tax rates, so, so the population is going up anyway. So you don't really want it to go up anymore because things are going to get seriously out of control and squalor is going to go haywire. Instead, I would just take it, you know, more chill, get some ports in, get the trade going as opposed to the farming. That's personally what I would do. But also, as you start conquering territory, um, you will, you know, sack settlements and all that and be able to get more money out of them. An advantage, like I said to you earlier, let's say, for example, you did decide to abandon a Varicum. It goes into rebel hands then you can retake it and get a lot of money out of that again. So you're kind of purging your own settlement, but hey, money is good, right? So yeah, that is what I want to say. There's a huge amount of to cover in this campaign. I'm trying to cover as much of the early stage as I you know, possibly can. Now let's discuss very quickly, uh, and towards the end, the Eastern Roman Empire. You start off as, quote unquote, allies. Now really, this isn't a proper alliance. I mean, it technically is. But unlike Rome Total War, the base game, you, you start off at war with certain factions and you start off allied to certain factions. Now in Rome Total War, the Roman factions are allied to each other, but it's a real proper alliance where uh, until you've built a really big empire, you just physically can't attack each other. But also, you have access to uh, trade rights, map information, you can wander through the territory they don't mind. With the Eastern Roman um, Empire, you don't get that luxury. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you just don't have with the Eastern Roman Empire. I'm pretty sure you can't just walk through their territory. I'm pretty sure you don't get all their map information and all that. So it's a very flimsy alliance. And likely what will happen is the Eastern Roman Empire will probably be one of the first to attack you. Unless they're really getting bombarded by hordes or the Sassanids or maybe the, the barbarian factions. They're quite likely to attack you early on. Now what you've got to hope they do is attack you maybe in areas like Salona and keep them in sort of buffer states. Just try and hold them back for as long as you can while solidifying your empire. Once you solidify your empire, which will take time, but once you've completely Christianized your empire, once you've got a really solid economy and you start building up some troops from the important recruiting regions like Rome and Ravenna, that's when you strike against the Eastern Roman Empire. So I would say striking against the Eastern Roman Empire would probably be one of my main priorities. Um, once you've actually solidified the empire because they've got a lot of 
rich settlements, they've got a lot of access to trade routes, which will then further increase your economy and all that. I wouldn't be focusing too much on the barbarian factions, and there's a couple of reasons. First of all, if you eliminate, quote unquote, eliminate some of the barbarian factions, for example, and um, the Sarmatians, I believe is uh, an example. Let's say you went to the, um, the Campus, is it Campus Sarmate? Vicar Sarmatae, or however you, you say that, and you kill them, you think, great, I've got a settlement, they're going to respawn as a horde, and they're going to be a lot more difficult to deal with. They're going to look like these guys, but holding yellow flags instead of brown ones, which isn't good. So attacking barbarian areas, first of all, isn't the most profitable thing ever. But second of all, actually can spawn hordes and it's kind of like, what is it? Like that, you know that in mythology, that snake thing that you cut off the head and then two grows back or whatever? Kind of the same thing, you know you're you're really actually doing yourself a disservice what you kind of want is you want the barbarian factions to squabble amongst themselves sort of destroy themselves hopefully the hordes don't get too big hold back whatever you can at the bridges and so on and so forth and then eventually you can strike into the eastern roman empire rather than trying to get these stupid villages that the barbarians are squabbling over so i think i covered as much as i can um, I would recommend, if you really want some more detail, to watch campaigns of this. For example, uh, Many a True Nerd did a very good and detailed analysis on his first episode of Rome Toads War Barbarian Invasion, um, where he discussed this. I think Legend of Toads War, uh, quite a while ago, did a, a Western Roman Empire campaign as well. He did very well on that. So, if you want a super, super in-depth guide, then go to them. But the main things I would do, Christianize the Empire, try and cut down on um, taxes as much as you can, move the capital and don't over expand too quickly you want to make sure that you solidify what you've got and if a settlement is going to go over to rebels make sure they don't have too much to work with try and destroy as many buildings that are unnecessary and try and destroy as many troops as necessary in order to sort of cut expenditure i think i've c covered as much as i can let me know if i've missed stuff because i probably have you know this is the most the mo probably the most deep and complex campaign that I've ever covered with these faction guides so you know it's a really tough one um, to discuss but yeah if you want to have a look also at the Eastern Roman Empire faction guide where I talk more about the units and sort of uh, battle strategy then go over to that and I've also made plenty of faction guides for Rome Total War Medieval 2 and I've also done some for the other factions of Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion so thank you very much for watching hope you enjoyed hope this was useful and I'll be back with more videos very very soon I'll see you around.